and today is September 9th and we're going to kick off the networking series for the VMware Certified Professional today. So today we are going to cover objective one um, of the VCP NV. For those of you who are new, um, my name is Tom Puxe. I work as an escalation engineer um, at the VMware Cork office. You can follow me on Twitter and I'm kind of a VMware certification addict as well. Um, additionally, I, I also recently just took the um, CCNA, so that is why from a personal standpoint of view, um, the NSX exam or the VCPNV is particularly interesting to me as well. So what are we going to cover today? Um, I will cover the groundworks about the VCPNV since that is kind of the prerequisite to actually jump into the topics. And then I will loosely follow the blueprint um, for the first objective. Due to the time constraint, uh, it will probably not be possible to, to cover each and every sub-objective um, of that blueprint but you should get a good idea of what you're getting into um, for the exam itself. I haven't set the exam myself yet. Um, I'm, I'm scheduled depending on availability either this week or next week. Um, so this is really just uh, what I got out of the blueprint um, and the few exam um, experiences that have been blocked so far. Ross Wynn for example, uh, recently took the exam and shared his experience on his blog. So what does the blueprint actually request from you in Objective 1? The first thing is that you will need to be able to explain the benefits of a VMware NSX implementation. You will need to be able to describe the VMware NSX architecture. You will need to be able to uh, describe network and security technologies, physical and virtual network technologies. Since NSX is not only a VMware technology, you will also need to be able to describe the third-party integration um, of NSX services. And one of the newest flagship products um, that NSX has or that VMware has a vCloud Automation Center and that can also integrate with NSX and that is also covered in the blueprint. You will need to be able to describe how VCAC actually integrates with NSX. So let's go into the first topic. Can, can someone just give me short feedback if you actually see my screen? Because normally I should get some, some watermark around it. And this time I don't. Okay, grant. Thanks. If you have any questions during the, uh, during the shoutcast, um, you can post them on Twitter with the hashtag vbrownback. Um, I, or use the chat or the actual question board as well. So what are the prerequisites to actually take the exam? Um, the exam itself is proctored by Pearson View. Oh, and I see I've got a typo in there. They are actually written with an S. The length is two hours plus a 15 minutes um, pre-exam survey and you will be asked 120 questions which means you roughly got one minute per question which might sound pretty fast paced um, to some that are not familiar with we Ember exams but it's actually a lot of time. I've, I've yet to see someone 
especially on the VCP. And since I'm working here in support at VMware, um, we basically all have to take the VCP exams to actually fail because of time limitations. Usually, you can read each question within t 10 to 15 seconds, and then got a 45-second span to answer them. Normally, in a VCP, you can also jump around questions at the end. You can mark questions for review and then jump back to them. I'm, since I didn't set the exam yet, I'm not entirely sure if that is correct for the VCP NV as well, um, but I personally would definitely think so. It is a scaled, and yeah, Roswin just confirmed, you, you can mark questions for review. Um, that is something that is not possible, for example, in, in the um, design decaps, except for the um, desktop design decap. You can't jump around in there. VMware uses, uses a scaled scoring method, which means um, no matter what kind of question pool you're getting, your bottom score will be 100, the top score will be 500, and the pass mark will always be 300 points. The points are weight, though. Depending on what kind of question you are getting, they're worth more or less points. And in the end, it's, it's just put into a scale um, so that you can't really tell, for example, like the EMC exams, um, where you have to get 67% of the questions right, or broadcade exams, for example. Um, you cannot say, OK, for the VCP, I need 50% correct, I need 60% correct, or 70% correct. It completely depends on the question set you're getting. So in a couple of months, um, we also have an expiry period on the VCPs, which means that the VCP NV will be valid for two years until you have to reset the exam again, branch out to a different VCP exam, or do a VCIX or a VCAP exam to recertify yourself. The official recommendation is to have at least six months hands-on experience with, um, with NSX itself and a decent background in virtualization and also in networking experience. Since this is not really a practical exam, but rather a multiple choice test, you can get by with way less experience. But um, you would need to decide, do I really just pass the exam, or do I want to learn something for myself, for my job, for my career from it? This one is really, really new for VMware. Usually, to get a VCP, you had to take one of the official training courses. Most people actually took the ICM, the uh, Install, Configure, Manage. Um, if you were already skilled in um, the install stuff, you had the option of the Optimize and Scale. For NSX, right now, as a qualifying course, there would only be the ICM. But if you are either a CCNA or CCNP routing and switch, or a CCNA or CCNP data center, you can actually take the VCP exam without any course requirement, which means you can save up to 2,000 or 3,000 bucks, which is very nice, as the actual CCNA is way way cheaper to achieve um, an ICM for most. If you're currently a VCP, you will also be able to just take the exam. And that's also true uh, if you get the VCP NV. You can then take the VCP DCV, um, the VCP Cloud, the VCP um, View, and also the um, upper stack VCAP exams on top of it. If you have neither VCP or a CCNA, unfortunately, you will need to sit the actual uh, VMware NSX install, configure, and manage course. With that being said, um, let's jump into the first 
real um, section of objective one. And the first thing I want to cover are the challenges with, uh, with physical networking and also the key benefits of the, uh, of the NSX platform. Since basically everything of section one is of a described type of questions, you're not needed to know um, every tiny bit in detail but you should rather get the big picture how everything integrates with each other and um, especially the VCPs really like to ask sometimes uh, in which submenu would you find uh, option X to complete task Y. So you, you should have some familiarity with the GUI, etc. And as, as far as as it comes to such service definitions, um, you, you should all, always know the advantages and additionally also the disadvantages of uh, specific solutions. And that is something you just either know or you need to learn by heart. You can find all of these in the actual um, design guide and in the initial NSX white paper um, that three pages white paper um, simply in introducing the solution. So in the physical world, the actual um, physical networking systems are very complex and vendor specific. Network provisioning itself is very, very slow compared to what it could be. If we compare um, server deployment, etc., cetera, um, virtualization has really given a great benefit. It, it went from months to days, and with vCloud Automation Center, you, you can talk minutes rather than days um, if, if everything is really automated. Networking, on the other hand, has had kind of a standstill since the last 10, 15, 20 years network deployment, etc. still most of the time at least requires an actual team to configure the switches, to rack and stack everything, to provision VLANs, to provision port group security, etc. And that is a very slow and manual process. Workload placement and mobility are also limited by the physical topology. If you have dispersed sites, etc. Most people actually do, and most companies actually um, do not have a stretched layer two yet. They keep two separate domains, which um, most of the time means you, you don't have that mobility of a workload. Um, you need dedicated hardware. You need specific hardware. To, to implement networking these days. Um, this can create ar artificial barriers, but also can create vendor lockouts. And due to the fragmentation, again, um, there is a common mantra in here. <laughs> the, the actual deployment uh, and all the stuff around us is very inefficient. And especially for the large service providers and cloud providers, with a physical network, um, the the actual VLAN, VLAN sprawl and also firewall sprawl, um, port configuration, um, access controllers, um, the larger the enterprise gets, the less it does scale when you do it manually uh, in a not policy-driven way. So what are the key benefits NSX would actually offer to those, um, to those challenges? Since NSX is, uh, does provide an API, it can be highly automated. Most of the stuff mentioned above can, can actually be either scripted, um, called by an API, or by a third-party solution, um, if you don't want to call it manually via the web client and uh, thus it does actually increase efficiency. 
It is independent of hardware. Uh, VMware's catchphrase is to actually um, that that we can work with NSX on every IP capable um, networking hardware. It should still have some qualities and possibilities. For example, we need um, an increased MTU size, so it is not exactly any any, but we can work on most, and we don't care if it is uh, vendor specific or not. You can mix and match as long as the underlying networking hardware has actual IP connectivity. And due to the API extensibility, also third parties can easily integrate with NSX. Due to the possibility that there is a so-called layer two bridging for workloads, the actual deployment for NSX can be done basically without any downtime. You can non-disruptively deploy NSX in an environment if you want to. You also need to know the common use cases for the VCP. And the, the benefits for the use, use cases are more or less always the same. Um, it resolves around automation and efficiency. But uh, what's listed in here and what the, um, what the actual customers like eBay, etc., um, do with it for once is data center automation, especially for large data centers, self-service enterprise IT in, in regards especially of the um, isolation of different environments. This would basically map to VCAC. Same as multi-tenant clouds. Here as well, the, the automated network provisioning and the um, isolation between tenants. Plus, as a service provider, you can actually um, use your hardware more efficient. Um, you, you can oversubscribe your networking hardware, etc., with an overlay network. Data center simplification goes into the same same branch, and especially the uh, the freedom on the physical side to uh, to not have to use as many VLANs or firewall rules, because they can be uh, polic uh, created policy in a policy driven way, rather than manually configuring them, um, is also a very good use case for NSX. You're expected to know the common terms of NSX, which means um, you, you, NSX introduces, especially for a virtualization admin, it does introduce a completely new terminology. The, the layers of abstraction are, are still OK for a virtualization admin, but if you're not familiar with, uh, with networking at all, and you've been more the computer or the storage guy, you, you will need to know um, common terms like MTU, um, what is it, the difference between the data plane, the control plane, the management plane, and the consumption layer, for example. So for an MTU, I already mentioned it. Um, it's a ma maximum transfer unit which means that's the largest packet size the network would allow without um, fragmentation. This needs to be actually configured end-to-end. -end. For NSX, another important term to actually span the logical layer is um, the so-called VTAP, the virtual tunneling endpoint, which on the hypervisor uh, level actually simply maps to a port group, and which is the the tunneling endpoint for the overlay network. The overlay network then is the logical on top network that gets created and uses the physical network 
simply as a means of transportation and not for the actual services layer. The services layer itself is then rather created in the data plane. The data plane consists um, of the logical switch which uh, would map to a transport zone and it does depending on uh, multi-hypervisor or vSphere NSX use either the open v switch or the NSX switch and the NSX v switch is basically just a normal virtual distrib distributed switch um, which has some added functionality. In our case it is VXLAN which is a overlay transport protocol. We do have the distrib distributed logical routers in the data plane and also the distributed firewall. Between the control plane and the data plane. The data plane is where all the switching will then be done. This is where your actual data traffic lies. You do then have a control plane. Um, in this control plane you would have your NSX controllers. These are machines that store all the important tables like the up and MAC cache. The control plane is there to manage. It no real data flow except for management data, should go through the control pane. The bridging element can be an NSX edge. It, it's not directly sitting in the data plane uh, per se. You can connect the data plane you, to the NSS, NSX edge. In, in this case, the NSX edge is um, the, services route, uh, the services router. This is what would provide all the um, functionality like load balancing, etc., and north-south switch uh, routing. The distributed logical router would provide east-west routing without going over the first hop. To actually manage everything, you would have a management plane. You don't want your management to sit in the control plane or even worse in the actual data plane. Because if your management is down, your network still continues to function. In our case, the management plane is the NSX manager. And then the top layer, usually also referred to as layer 8, if you're not using a cloud provider um, portal, but rather just a web client as a single user would be the extra consumption layer, the layer that consumes everything, which can be virtual machines, um, classes of virtual machines, blueprints in, in terms of uh, VCAC, for example. Functions and services um, that you will need to know. And we will go a bit more in detail um, on the next couple of slides. But NSX provides uh, especially the edge, um, the NSX edge, the service gateway, does provide a lot of services, networking services. And the stance here is that um, the NSX, NSX edge should not necessarily, uh, necessarily be the uh, replacement for dedicated physical hardware um, for everything. So if you have a dedicated load balancing appliance um, that has a lot of throughput, you can still continue to use that. But especially um, as an integrated solution when you don't have, um, don't have some of these services appliances um, as physical hardware standing or lying around, um, you can also use a software solution. As a value add, you get a logical firewall, you get a logical load balancer, you get VPN capabilities, you now have a logical layer 2 switch, and also two types of routers, as already said, the logical distributed router for east-west 
traffic and the logical um, the NSX uh, edge router for north south. From an architecture point of view, it's it's basically um, what I explained under the common terms. Architecturally, the first thing and the only thing that will be installed is the NSX manager, and that manages the deployment of everything else. So if you want to deploy a new NSX Edge um, or a new controller VM, that would all go through the NSX manager. It can be consumed by an API if you do want to go through that. Um, Chris Wall has a blog series about NSX and he shows how you can actually create new controller VMs using a REST client in, uh, in your web browser. Or you can simply use the actual um, web client interface since the NSX manager after the installation um, integrates with vCenter server and therefore also with um, the vCenter web client. So the first thing you would do after the deployment of the NSX manager is to create NSX controller nodes. These will always um, be deployed in an uneven number and they basically control, um, control the the control plane. You then um, can create, when the NSX controllers are rolled out, you can install the VIBs on the hosts. Um, this is called preparing the hosts. If you had VXLAN from VCNS uh, in 5.5 .5 because you were, for example, using VCloud Director, you can simply update um, the VIBs. You cannot roll this solution out to standalone hosts. This will be something that will be rolled out cluster right. After you prepared the hosts and all the VIBs get installed and you now have an NSX switch rather than a normal um, distributed switch, you will also have a user agent installed. This user agent then is used um, for the NSX controllers to actually talk to the host, um, especially for the distributed uh, virtual router. When everything is configured in there, you will be creating what is called a transport, a transport zone. This basically is the reach of your layer 2 domain then. You can add clusters into that transport zone to, to define the span of the zone. So you can skip out clusters. You can have more than one transport zone if you want to. The transport zone basically is your overlay network. Once you have created that transport zone, you will be able to create logical switches on that transport zone. Those are isolated instances to which you can then attach VMs. You can attach service routers like the distributor, uh, like the NSH, to have your upstream connectivity. You can also connect distributed logical routers to have east-west connectivity, especially if you're going through the same host. If you want to have um, two logical switches um, and VMs are on these two logical switches and you want to connect them, if they are on the same host so that you do not need to go over the physical network, you don't need to reach the outside first hop, a distributed logical router will actually help in that to, to lower the actual bandwidth on the physical network. And that is part of one of the following modules, um, virtual routing and switching, um, will be part of the follow-up modules in, in later sessions. So how does this actually look like in the web client? 
if you are familiar with the hands-on lab, and I talked with Doug Bear just yesterday, if I can actually publicly say this, um, his, his most favorite use case for the hands-on labs is that you can actually diverge from the manual that you're given with each lab, and you can play around for yourself. So as soon as you have installed the NSX manager, you will, in the web client, get the networking and security plugin. For the first start, it can, if you're deploying it at home or in, in your lab environment, it can take uh, four or five minutes to actually start the web client after the initial installation. But afterwards, uh, logins should be way faster again. All the installation and all the preparation tasks to um, actually deploy the NSX controllers are done under the management tab. As you can see, um, this lab environment from the hands-on labs, and you get to this by simply searching for NSX and taking the first lab that pops up. This is the 1303 lab. You, you can see that it was installed in a three-node fashion which is also the recommended uh, way by VMware. You can add new NSX controller nodes. You simply choose a data center, resource pool, and an uplink switch where they live to. After these are deployed, and the loading bar and the lovely web client has gone away, you then will be able to actually uh, prepare the hosts, which uh, is simply the installation of a VIB or of three VIBs and the user world agent. You then need to create a so-called segmentation ID pool. This, from a concept point of view, you can think of this as VLANs. Every uh, new logical switch will eat up one segmentation ID pool. Um, they start at 5,000 and go up to 16 million something. So you can have way more segmentation ID pools than, or segmentation IDs than you can have actual VLANs, which even within the extended range would only cover you for 4,096 with uh, 0 and 4,095 uh, usually not usable. So you can span way more isolated networks with that. For the transport zone, you can actually add and remove your clusters then. And you can also say which way of control plane traffic you want. There's unicast, multicast, and hybrid. And later models, uh, modules will go into details what each of them means. Um, for the exam, you should know that hybrid is the recommendation for performance reasons. Unicast will be chosen if you do not have advanced features on the switch or you do not want to configure them like PIM and IGMP uh, spoofing. Uh, snooping, not spoofing, sorry. Once you have created your transport zone, you then can create logical switches. These are independent entities. And after the creation of logical switches, you can also create logical routers or virtual routers, either as a parameter router, which would be the normal NSX, uh, NSX Edge services gateway, or as a distributed router within, within the host to route east and westbound traffic. For the functional services that the NSX Edge can actually um, deploy, as I already said, it 
provides north-south routing. And it can also learn routes not only via static routes, but also via dynamic routing. Um, OSPF here being the primary protocol. It can provide a firewall service. It does NAT as well in terms of either source or destination NAT or even both. The later routing uh, modules will actually cover what each of this is. Especially for closed networks, for isolated networks, it can serve as a DHCP server. It can be used for site-to-site -site VPN and also which, which leverages IAPSEC. Um, it can be used as a layer 2 VPN to actually stretch your data center network from one data center to another data center. And it can allow users to remotely log in um, via providing SSL VPN plus capabilities. There is a load balancing feature on the NSX Edge as well. And not only the NSX Edge, but also the distributed router do have a high availability function, not in terms of active-active, but rather in terms of active-passive. So as soon as um, one VM goes down within a couple of seconds, the passive VM would actually take over. And you also have a distributed firewall as a service in here. You're supposed to also know some physical network topology. Um, I will not go into detail um, over this in here. Um, this is basically all described in the actual architecture guide, in the design guide uh, on 30 plus pages, especially the fourth and backs of, uh, of the several uh, modes. There is more than one topology out there. Um, what VMware in the design guide describes as um, the so-called leaf and spine architecture. You could also have um, access distribution and core layer um, architecture, but the, um, but the one you definitely should study for, for the exam is the uh, leaf and spine architecture, especially in conjunction with the um, with the distribution of services into compute racks, um, infrastructure racks, and also edge racks, which would then provide the outbound connectivity to external networks. For basic NSX topology, which you're supposed to know, um, this would be one of the easiest examples. In the bottom area, you would have three logical switches. Each different color does actually mean a separate logical switch. And on the host would then be a distributed router, which means if you had a VM on the web logical, on the blue switch, that wants to talk to a VM on the orange switch for the um, DB layer, for example, or rather the, um, the green switch, which would be the app layer. It would go through the logical router without ever going to the actual gateway. That could be a service gateway. That could be a physical actual router because the logical distributed router also does understand the, the concept of dynamic routing protocols. 
this can be separated by tenants. Um, so these two networks could very well be using the same switched infrastructure without the traffic ever being exposed to the other. Normally then, um, the, uh, the distributed routers would be connected to an uplink router. Um, again, this can be a physical router or, as in this example, an NSX Edge uh, service gateway. The actual upgrade requirements, and n at least knowing the other VCPs, this is something that VMware will heavily test on normally. Service integration usually is on the lighter side, but especially the upgrade, um, the upgrade passes, uh, the requirements for upgrades, um, that is something you definitely can expect questions on. So for NSX to be used, and this is NSX for vSphere, you will need vCenter Server 5.5 or higher. You will need at least ESXi 5.0. Unicast mode um, is only available in ESXi 5.5. And for vShield endpoint and data security, you will also need at least hardware version 7 or 8. And the VMware tools 8.6 need to be installed. There is a certain upgrade procedure or install procedure, depending if you already had um, VCNS, um, vCenter Networking and Security installed or not. The first thing to install or to upgrade would be the actual NSX manager. If you have a uh, VCNS manager, you simply load the VIB into the normal upgrade page. There's a, uh, not VIB, Tajisub. There is a specific upgrade package available for download to, um, to upgrade the NSX manager. And basically nearly all configuration data, um, nearly all objects will be carried over from an upgrade point of view. The next thing you would do is to upgrade um, or create, no, in an upgrade scenario, you would actually um, upgrade the logical switches. So if we go back to the lab, you, you would have logical switches also from, um, from VCNS if you deployed vCloud Director with uh, VXLAN and you could simply then, a button would appear to actually upgrade these switches. The next thing you would upgrade is the actual NSX firewall. And as a requirement, um, if you used vShield app before, then that would be the upgrade path. Um, this needs to be at least version 5.5. From below that, you would actually need to upgrade vShield up to 5.5. Um, NSX Edge, it's, it's basically the same. Um, if you had Edge devices from VCNS, these can be upgraded to, um, to NSX Edges and they need to have the NSX manager in place and the logical switches need to have been upgraded. You will also need to be able to, um, when you're doing it via the GUI, to meet the minimum hardware requirements. The shit endpoint can also simply be upgraded. And the only thing that cannot really upgrade it in the path is actually NSX data security. Um, that would result in an uninstall and um, reinstall. There is no direct upgrade path for data security. Um, 
after the NSX manager is uh, upgraded, you will then be able to install NSX data security in version 6.0. And um, if you forgot that step to actually uninstall data security, you won't have a GUI option to remediate it. You will actually need a REST services call. So a REST API call to, to eliminate the data security. For partner solutions, um, there usually also is no direct upgrade path that is supported by VMware. Um, either the partner does have uh, an upgrade installer themselves, or you will probably need to re-import it via the service composer, etc. NSX is leveraging a lot of old core technology, and there are very good webcasts already about the core technologies, and also um, three books that I would recommend. The first one, and from my point of view, especially from the writing style, uh, the best book is Networking for VMware Administrators by uh, Chris Wall and Steve uh, Pantel. The second one is uh, VMware vSphere Design. Since this is based on 5.5, uh, obviously the second edition. And also mastering uh, VMware vSphere 5.5 by Scott Lowe and uh, Nick Marshall. Um, concentrate on the network um, networking chapters in these books. Especially concentrate on the on on the parts that describe the advanced features. Um, do not go into the uh, standard vSwitches too much, because uh, basically everything a standard vSwitch can do can be done on a distributed switch as well, and NSX obviously needs the distributed switches. So you should know where to configure port mirroring, what port mirroring is, how, how to configure ne uh, NetFlow, what NetFlow actually does, so analysis of traffic rather than, of, or of traffic flows rather than an exact, uh, exact packet capture mechanism. You will need to uh, be able to distinguish also between the vSphere NSX and multi-hypervisor NSX um, and know the similarities and even more importantly the differences. I've, I've listed some of them here. Um, the first one would be the actual um, virtual switch being used. On vSphere NSX uh, this is the normal distributed switch which, which becomes an NSX vSwitch then. In um, multi-hypervisor, oh, another typo. <laughs> multi-hypervisor NSX, um, you would actually use the open vSwitch. For the overlay network as an encapsulation method, uh, vSphere NSX actually uses VXLAN. And multi-hypervisor NSX can use uh, VXLAN as well, but also does support GRE and SCT. As a service gateway, uh, we do use the NSX Edge appliance. In multi-hypervisor, um, you would actually use um, physical NSX gateway appliances. East-West routing is done in vSphere NSX in, within the kernel um, and firewall as well. Firewalling in multi-hypervisor goes the classical way by um, access control lists and security groups. And there are additional capabilities uh, that are baked into uh, vSphere NSX like load balancing and VPN capabilities. There is a whole hands-on lab. Um, on the multi-hypervisor part, uh, which would be the 1319, and on that regard as well, um, Doug said, Doug Bear said there would be a blog post by 
around 5 p.m. Irish time. Um, there is not yet. But if you actually log into the hands-on labs page, you will be able to find that um, there have been more labs added um, since yesterday. Either yesterday or today. I'm, I'm not too sure when I checked this morning. It was definitely more than a couple of days before. So if you choose all labs and after it loads, you can simply search for NSX in all catalogs. Um, the one that I would recommend, um, really recommend is the 1303, simply because of the fact you have VMs deployed in there. Uh, it is the basic NSX lab and you can just deviate from the blueprint. Basically every password is VMware, capital V, capital M, uh, one exclamation mark. Um, you can play around with that. Actually look what is being done on the host in the center while you're configuring a controller VM, while you're configuring a uh, service gateway so an NSX edge and what happens when you deploy a virtual distributed router. And the ones in the bottom here, the 412, 413 and 415 are actually the NSX labs that have been introduced at VMworld uh, 2014 in the US and they are available right now um, as well for the public use case. So if you're studying for NSX, definitely go through the task in those as well. And now I can basically bring back the browser. You're supposed to know certain things um, about the value add. You, you also need to be able to compare virtual router and virtual router capabilities to physical routers. Um, they most of the time behave the same, except that uh, virtual routers are according to VMware, not limited to um, the normal router limits, like um, the MAC address table, um, I, uh, I, routing table, etc. size that can limit physical environments. What I really wanted to show you is the service composer. Once I find my lab again. What the Service Composer actually allows you to do is to create um, security groups and then add certain security policies to those security groups and apply them to VMs. And this is one of the one of the examples um, we we mentioned in the very beginning as an value add for for NSX. You can have certain security policies. You can create your own policies, which then would normally include an endpoint service, which usually is just an antivirus. Or you can include vulnerability management. You can have default actions in there, certain firewall rules. For example, for your web servers, you mainly want to block everything else uh, that is not port 80. You have, can have network inspection services. And then simply apply these security policies you're creating to, to groups. And here in these groups, you can map VMs by, by computer OS you can map them by their name. You can create a security tag and um, add policies to the um, 
to a VM when it gets tagged, for example, after a vi virus scan has been found, or uh, after a virus scan has actually found a virus, you can add, um, via VSheet endpoint, you can add a security tag to the VM, and automatically, instantly, uh, due to the security policy, move it to a quarantine network, so that it cannot talk to the, your actual enterprise network anymore until that virus issue is resolved. And this really shows the capabilities of the automation that can be done within, um, within NSX. Another very good use case, especially since I was asked this in the system operations part um, a lot, is to have a compliance view of sensitive, uh, sensitive data stored within the VMs. Um, we actually do have a lot of customers calling in um, with uh, mostly PCI compliant environments, asking either for security best practices or security scans, etc. And with NSX, you can actually with um, VSheet en in, in combination with VSheet endpoint, um, you can have a look into sensitive data in the VMs to ensure regulatory um, compliance as well. It is policy driven and it does actually support PCI, PHI and PII. And since the screenshot is of rather bad quality, it's also easier shown. After you have created um, reports, uh, your policies, you can either get reports on them or view them in a dashboard. And to actually manage it, you can scan your whole environment. Again, to be able to do so, you will need VSHADE endpoint um, for the API to be actually exposed. And you can then select out of a very large regulation pool of what you actually want to scan for. And depending on the actual regulation that you select, you can then also set a data pattern that you want to scan for. Additionally, you can create um, policies for the actual files um, that you want to scan in. So especially for customers that um, do need to follow compliance standards, this is a really great feature of NSX. Third party integration is, especially since I already mentioned um, something like VShield Endpoint, um, the VMware per se does not provide you with a VShield Endpoint appliance with a service VM. These come from partners, Trend Micro, Kaspersky, for example, and these third-party services then need to either automatically register with NSX or you can manually register them with NSX, and I also can show that. They're done in the service definitions. You can simply, um, if you have to do it manually, you can do so by just following the vendor guidelines on all the fields you have to fill in here. And these, then again, can be actually used in the services composer to have your, um, your security uh, policies enhanced for them and applied to, to your VMs or to your groups. And if needed, um, sometimes 
especially in the case of Endpoint. Um, after registering the solution, you will also be needed to um, deploy the Partner Virtual Appliance, which normally comes in, uh, in an OVF form. And they then talk to the NSX controller for management um, and integrate via the controller in, into the NSX environment. For the NSX integration with um, vCloud Automation Center, I would like to refer um, in the study material to one of the uh, VMware blog posts because Grant Orchard actually, and I hope I didn't mangle his name now, uh, Grant Orchard actually did a very good job of posting three videos um, on YouTube exactly covering what you will need uh, for the blueprint, going through each of the steps and actually demoing what you need to do um, to, uh, to integrate NSX with vCloud Automation Center. So as an example of actually preparing um, VCAC for NSX integration, the first step you would need to do is to add the NSX manager to um, as a vSphere endpoint. If you're adding a vSphere endpoint, you can actually choose a tick box for the um, VCNS or NSX manager URL. You then would need to configure reservations which means you would configure the external network profiles, um, the transport zone, and the routed gateway within the res uh, reservation. And afterwards, after you created and configured your reservations, you would configure the uh, multi-machine blueprints, which means in the blueprint you specify the actual transport zone, and therefore can um, can leverage the NSX um, logical network. You would also need to configure network profiles in the actual blueprint. At your since this is a multi-machine blueprint, at the VM blueprints, and uh, for each VM blueprint, then edit the network settings, um, associate the correct network profile with the uh, network settings, and maybe configure additional services like load balancers. Again, um, the videos will show this each step by step um, and explain it in a way better way uh, than I'm able to do because Grant is really better in VCAC than I'll probably ever be. For study resources, um, Ross Wynn actually said you would probably only need three of them which would be the NSX Administration Guide, the Design Guide, and the Installation and Upgrade Guide. Um, so those three definitely. Chris Wall on his blog has actually a five blog post series on deploying NSX. Um, he starts by the manager, goes over the um, controllers, and also shows how to do that stuff with the actual um, API calls which uh, was so far the only website where I found um, the REST API uh, shown publicly. As already mentioned and shown, there is a couple of hands-on labs. My recommendation personally would be to first simply do the steps. Be careful with time. Um, the 1303 is actually an eight-hour lab. Um, and I tried, you cannot do it uh, simply in, in an afternoon in three, four hours. You will need a lot of time for it. And um, the bottom one is the actual link uh, for the videos of Grand Orchard um, for the VCAC integration with NSX. And with this, we are basically done for today. And um, next week, Ross Wynn will also cover um, Section 2 and Objective 2 of the Blueprint. 
If you do have any questions, um, please raise your hand um, or write them in the chat, and I will try to answer them. As there don't seem to be any questions, yeah, I would like to thank you for your attendance and attention. And I hope we will see you next week uh, when Ross is actually covering Objective 2. Have, have a good night.